Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So good morning for the third time, and now it's on. Uh, my name is Anna Shavit, and uh, on behalf of the Institute for Politics and Society, I'll be your moderator. But let's move uh, to our issues today and mostly to our speakers. So once again, warm welcome. I hope you all have uh, your breakfast. Uh, don't hesitate if you need more coffee to go and get it. Let's keep it uh, more or less informal. Uh, so as you well as well as you know, uh, the topic of today is migration. And uh, some of you might ask the question why we are talking about it in Prague on this uh, beautiful, though a little chilly day. Uh, a country known for not having very high numbers in uh, migration or except, expecting, accepting, well, excuse me, people maybe, though expecting a lot of them to come. Um, so we talk briefly as our speakers and uh, we will start first with actually saying how we understand and how we define migration. Then we will look at uh, the current situation, uh, also including Turkey. The agreement European Union has with Turkey is so far being efficient, but of course there is a lot of ifs and question marks. And of course then also would be maybe perhaps interesting to look at the issue and the topic of migration, this relation, how, what's happening in Europe. I mean, people are cheering Macron for winning the election, but still, 30% of people, of uh, voters, voted for Marine Le Pen, which her party, she, her father, they have really a history of something, let's say, we used to call definitely extreme in Europe. So it's my pleasure here to welcome Lucia Slavkova. Uh, she's from the International Organization for Migration. Then on my left hand is Daniel Miket from the Republican Institute in uh, Hungary. Republican Institute is a liberal think tank, so uh, you can also ask how is your position in Hungary later. And then uh, it's also I would like to welcome Jan Kovács from the International Institute for the Institute for International Relations. Uh, both gentlemen are researchers, and uh, Lucia has uh, really long expertise focusing on migration, as she told me, from early 90s uh, when the Czech politicians were not always listening that this issue is a viable, very important issue to be dealt with. And I would like to also give uh, Lucia the word and to really start uh, with the topic itself, how to understand migration, how it's understood in our context, and uh, what the liberal democracies, how they should address the issue. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, experts. And uh, I'm really happy to be here, though uh, I was not informed that uh, the discussion will be in English. So uh, forgive me if I make some mistakes, because I'm not a native speaker. So sorry, my preparation was in Czech. But I think that we can do it somehow if you help me, OK? So first of all, I wanted to talk a, a bit uh, uh, about the uh, migration as such, how we can divide migration, how we can define migration. Then about uh, the, uh, uh, the definitions as such, who is refugee, who is migrant. Uh, are we going to talk about migration crisis? Are we going to talk about uh, refugee crisis? Is there any difference? Then uh, about um, the uh, influence of globalization on migration, because it is an uh, extremely important issue, or we can talk vice versa, migration and globalization. Uh, then I wanted to, to talk about uh, the national state and transnationalization. <coughs> Uh, and then, if we can uh, put together the, uh, the reasons, the, the background for migration crisis, or why it is happening uh, 2014, 2015, 16, and what about what's going to be next? Uh, what are the, uh, the future trends and how we can see? But, uh, please, uh, for that uh, second part, 
I would like uh, your questions, your comments, so that we can have a little bit of discussion on that. Otherwise, uh, it would be just my opinions, opinions of my organization, which is IOM. <clears throat> uh, so I want to have it more broad. Uh, uh, one sentence about me, I have started uh, 2000, uh, sorry, uh, 1990, uh, at uh, immigration police uh, here in, in this country. Then I moved to Ministry of Interior, MOI, and then uh, in 2000 I have changed MOI to IOM, uh, which is International Organization for Migration based in Geneva. Uh, the organization is a, is a broad and, and a very huge organization uh, with, uh, I think, 176 uh, member states. Uh, we have 40, 440 missions worldwide, and now from last year, September, we are a relevant organization to UN after 65 years. Uh, so um, um, now we are, uh, let's say, with the family of, of, of UN. Um, I'm going to talk about international migration because we know that we can talk about internal migration, we can divide uh, migration to legal and irregular. Uh, in IOM we don't say illegal because we don't believe that a person can be illegal by its substance, you know, it's impossible. So um, we can talk uh, about uh, uh, definition or, or division of migration uh, by a lot of aspects, but let's talk about international migration because this is something what does uh, what interests us more. Uh, about the the definitions in migration: who is refugee, who is asylum seeker, who is migrant. Uh, if you see migration as a as a huge plate teller, cake, you would see that uh, a majority uh, of uh, people in that cake are migrants, either economic migrants or migrants circular or migrants that are trying to uh, reunite with uh, his or her family. And part of that is humanitarian migration. Part of that and a smaller part are those who are seeking asylum, seeking international protection. So, uh, among all that aspects of migration is humanitarian migration, and this is something what we can call refugees, if they receive, or they, if they are granted uh, refugee status. So, I tend to call uh, the whole crisis in the numbers, in the numbers, as migration crisis, not uh, not refugee crisis. Uh, why we should uh, let's say put attention to migration is it it is is it because of the numbers? Well, definitely no. Uh, the numbers are not that high, even though uh, we can read in in newspaper uh, every day. Um, a lot of people who are coming from sub-Saharan Africa to uh, Europe or a lot of people who are coming from uh, Middle East to, to Europe, but the numbers are not that high, believe me, if we compare it with all the, uh, all the movements, migratory movements worldwide, it is definitely not the high uh, portion. Uh, but we still have to put attention to the numbers of people who are coming because of uh, demography, because of infrastructure, because of uh, education and schooling, because of migration and health, uh, because of uh, security, because of human rights. So there are a number of aspects that are connected with migration, with immigration uh, into the country. And we cannot just say, well, it's not the, the, the main problem that we have. 
uh, in 90s and early 2000, uh, when I met some Czech politicians, they were telling migration, that's easy. You know, and now in a number of years, it is migration is so high on the political ag agenda of a lot of uh, governments that uh, even the Czech Republic has to have some opinion on that, has to have some strategy. And do we have them in the Czech Republic? Do we have it? Uh, let's, uh, uh, let's say, reply or respond to, to that question. Um, uh, how big is the problem in Europe? Let's talk about numbers. Two-thirds, 67%, of all migrants are living in 20 countries in the world. Um, 47 million in US, less little bit in Germany uh, and Russia. Uh, Germany, second place, Russia, third place. Saudi Arabia, 10 million, Great Britain, 9 million. Uh, what, is the, what is the right expression to uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, 8 million. And uh, I have the uh, numbers from UNDESA and also IOM numbers. And uh, we are talking that, that Europe has 20 million and it's growing each year. The numbers are growing in Europe uh, only uh, uh, in some time after the uh, economic crisis, the numbers of uh, immigration, the number of immigration was decreasing, but now it's still increasing, but not dramatically. It's nothing what uh, would not uh, the, uh, European countries swallow. On the other hand, uh, the preparatory actions have to be there. And uh, we should be proactive rather than reactive. And the whole European, uh, I mean the whole EU is more reactive to immigration than proactive. Uh, Everybody says, oh, look at the uh, EU institutions, they are not uh, responding adequately. Oh, they are. The only thing is that we have to talk about uh, uh, special institutions in Brussels. Commission issuing one paper after another and trying to make member states moving in this regard. Uh, but there is uh, council and parliament, and this are, they are not very proactive, they are more reactive than, than anything else. So, uh, I don't want to criticize the Brussels institution saying, oh, they are so lazy and bureaucratic and they're not responding adequately. They are trying to do that from, from the very beginning, but where, is, where was the beginning? We all knew that the numbers were increasing, that people were, were trying to cross Mediterranean already 2012, all, already 2010. But then the numbers were not high, nobody put any attention. Only Lampedusa, only Sicily, they were you know, yelling, crying, listen, listen, we cannot manage, the numbers are too high. And uh, the, the, the response was not adequate at that time. Uh, what we can see in uh, some of the European countries, and especially in V4 countries, I mean Visegrad 4 countries, is the conflict between national state and uh, transnationalism. Uh, national state uh, for a long, long, long history and tradition and language was the base for, for, for the state. Uh, and immigration and ethnic diversity is, uh, you know, making uh, the, the national state a state, uh, little bit unstable, a little bit uh, a uh, little bit, uh, how should I put it, uh, 
burden for, for the national state. Uh, when, we, when we see the immigration countries like US, like Australia, like Canada, uh, the immigration was their strategy. So they, they don't have any problem with that now. But the national states with uh, traditions and history, they didn't have any strategy on immigration. And they still don't have it, unfortunately. What they see is the labor market, labor market which is very close, and labor market which should be, you know, secured. Uh, that's why I uh, doubt that they can that there can be any uh, joint uh, uh, position on immigration in uh, uh, EU because uh, labor markets are everywhere and we don't have joint one. So that's why we're so um, uh, protective to our labor market that uh, we see only uh, uh, we see only economic migration. We do not put and if I say we, I'm talking about the Czech Republic and Czech government. We don't uh, have any strategy on immigration except for the economic one, and the economic one is like uh, you see the the water supply. If we need migrants, we open it, and if we don't need migrants, then we close it. This is not the way how it, it, it is functioning. So, uh, what, I, what is lacking here is the strategy on immigration, though there is a paper, and we all know that it is the, uh, the immigration uh, principles, immigration strategy, uh, which was released last year, I believe. Uh, in the Czech Republic, a number of documents on EU side, a number of documents on UN side. Now we are all working on uh, global compacts on, on migration and uh, some of the pillars there. But uh, I doubt that uh, we can, I mean, I am 100% sure that there will, be, there, there will be a unity on accepting those documents. When it comes to implementation, that's a little bit different story as usual. Uh, migration crisis. Why do we have it? Um, I think that there are numbers of, uh, of reasons. And first of all, we uh, in Europe, we were so reactive that we let the migration industry uh, grow. Uh, do you know what I mean under migration industry? All the traffickers, all the smugglers, or the money inside, all, all the, the, the helpers, and uh, ships, and everything what can be connected with that. Uh, those who are preparing uh, uh, fraudulent documents, that's all migration industry. And this is involved. And uh, the uh, officials and uh, politicians and uh, 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 policymakers didn't put any attention to this migration industry in the uh, right time. Then I would say that one of the reasons is the uh, non control of internal borders, which made I mean, I'm not criticizing it's Schengen, it's it's good thing. <coughs> On the other hand, that was one of the things that they say, if you are in Europe, you can freely go wherever you want, because there is not control uh, uh, at the borders. Then we come to uh, war <coughs> conflicts, conflicts everywhere. If we talk about not only Syria, not only uh, Middle East as such, but we talk about Africa. There are five conflicts uh, right now. So we cannot say that uh, these people are coming only because of economic reasons. Uh, then of course, uh, uh, one of the things is the uh, social benefits, which people who are coming can use sometimes also misuse or abuse. Then we have uh, 
demographic explosion in the countries uh, in Africa and also Middle East. Then we have uh, economic and uh, religion, I would say, uh, fear or, or threat. And we have also um, uh, currently the existence of so-called Islamic State. That everything con combined and connected, uh, we can call about. Uh, we can uh, talk about the uh, the base for migration crisis. Uh, nowadays, if we call uh, as as usual, if you open any uh, any book on migration, you would uh, you would talk, uh, talk about push and pull factors. I think it's. Um, we are above that. Uh, push and pull factors means uh, that uh, uh, that the migratory trend is only one way. Uh, from the poor country to the rich country. Migration today is a circle migration, is something that has many, many directions and orientation. Uh, push and pull factors are not enough currently. We can uh, we can discuss it much more, and we have to find much more uh, reasons for migration. Migration is not a bad phenomenon. Uh, it has negative and positive uh, impacts, as usual, and as everything. Uh, in this country, we do not have any economist that would, uh, that would uh, write a book or, or research or at least rapid assessment about uh, the positive impact of, on, uh, of migration here in this country. And economists, they used to have the best data, you know, because they have normally hard data. But you cannot find any good uh, research on that so that we can say migration is not security threat, is not uh, a bad phenomenon. Look, there is a proof that it is the, uh, the good impact uh, on, on the majority, on the society. Uh, I don't know, I don't want to talk about uh, Mediterranean currently, like, you know, Balkan route and, and Middle uh, Mediterranean route and, and, and Western Mediterranean route and the numbers. I think we all know that. I mean, we're not here for that, are we? Well, I think maybe we will ask Daniel. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, opening uh, statements and remarks. I noticed a lot of you were making notes, so did I. Uh, but I would like, Daniel, if you could elaborate on this, uh, especially relating maybe to the roots and the situation in Hungary. What's the atmosphere? Hungary was also the country pretty much exposed to migration, which made Hungary very much known all around the globe, maybe not always uh, in the manner you would really like. Uh, I would, I would, I would, uh, I'm very pleased to do that. Uh, thank you for the for having us to, to be here. Uh, actually, I was, uh, I was uh, preparing to, uh, to speak more about the political consequences of migration, because as a matter of fact, I'm not an expert on the migration uh, per se, but I'm, I'm dealing more with uh, politics and civil society, and if you don't mind, uh, and I hope that we won't turn away from, from migration policies, I hope you don't mind, Jan, if I start to speak about uh, the, uh, the more like the political consequences of, of migration and especially how it uh, fostered or how it supported uh, populism, or, or give more impetus to, to populist movements and how could populist politicians uh, instrumentalize the uh, migration and this, uh, this, uh, this recent refugee crisis in 2015 and uh, if, if, it, uh, if it's about populism and migration and instrumentalization of refugees then uh, it's a good thing to coming from Hungary because then uh, you have uh, very first hand uh, experiences uh, if you allow me just some words about myself, um, at the, uh, as it was mentioned, I'm a research fellow at the Republican Institute and my uh, field of expertise is are social movements, civil society, and that's why I started to deal with, uh, with the rise of populism. And I think it's, uh, it's interesting that we are sitting here 
some uh, after the uh, the results of the French election because Viktor Orban he claimed that 2017 is going to be the the year of rebellion so some kind of uh, pan-European insurgency people is going to going to rebel uh, and they are going to probably uh, support populist politicians but as we saw it was not in the case last year at the Austrian presidential election it was not the case in the in the Dutch election and the and the, uh, the okay, people supported populist politicians, but but uh, somehow the the unity of of democratic or, or liberal forces, with the help of this uh, of this cooperation among these different uh, uh, political parties and forces, people could uh, could uh, uh, succeed over populist politicians. Uh, I don't want to really start to, to discuss. Uh, uh, we have we have actually a booklet uh, from the Republican Institute. There are communication strategies and how different liberal parties, what kind of uh, policies they drafted during the uh, the refugee crisis. It's available from our from our homepage. So if you're really interested into these communication strategies, then I recommend you to to check this check this publication. Uh, so my starting point is that uh, liberal democracy is not only liberal parties, but liberal democracies in general are facing a dual challenge. First of all, there is the refugee crisis as a policy issue, which should be solved. Uh, where are different? Uh, uh, there's there's a risk of a humanitarian crisis. Uh, there's a, there's a risk of uh, of, uh, of, a, of a continuous. Uh, influx of, of, of refugees and migrants with, uh, with actually European countries should uh, tackle this problem. But also there's a second challenge that uh, liberal democracies should, uh, should, should stick and they should, they should uh, uh, still promote the values of liberalism, human dignity, uh, human rights as well. So this, there's, a, there's a dual challenge. Uh, and also liberal parties and liberal democracies should, should tackle this problem. They should deal with the, with the refugee, refugee crisis. And at the same time, they should give a response to populist politicians. So I think in 2015, it was a question if there's a liberal answer at all to, to the refugee crisis. Uh, if, uh, because uh, even if it was about definitions, if there's if someone could be illegal as a, as a human being or not. Uh, the Hungarian government just started this billboard campaign, maybe you, you remember it, where they started to, to, uh, to stigmatize refugees, that they want to take away the jobs of the Hungarians, that they don't respect our culture and so on. So at the very beginning it was uh, a battle over definitions, uh, a battle over, uh, it was a, a, a discursive battle and it seemed that, that the, the Hungarian government, that Viktor Orban and his, and his notion about uh, 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 nationalist culture and, and about the liberal state could succeed over, over uh, traditional liberal values and uh, the respect for human dignity and, uh, and human rights. Uh, but actually, uh, how can someone respond to this dual challenge? What we saw in the case of, of, uh, of the U.S. presidential election, and I think it was also the case at the time of the Brexit, that uh, the populist forces uh, could satisfy the need of the electorate for more sovereignty. They could emphasize that they are those who can act. It was actually uh, what mattered at that time during these campaigns is uh, the capability of agency. So this agency matter, that Viktor Orban and others use instrumentalize the refugee crisis in order to, to show that they have, uh, they have agency, they can act, where others, like uh, <coughs> liberal parties, are already just discussing and talking about these, these issues and they don't want to act. So if you remember, this was actually, this is what I think this is what made uh, Donald Trump uh, so attractive to a lot of voters because he promised that we can get our sovereignty back, we're gonna expel these people, we're gonna we're gonna solve this problem very fast, and uh, and we give we're gonna give a very strict answer. And this was actually the same 
I think what Viktor Orban promised to, to the Hungarian voters at the time of, the, of this quota referendum in Hungary last year, uh, which fueled actually the, uh, the uh, US election. Uh, but what lies behind this need of people to, to get this sovereignty back and, and, and that why do they actually vote for politicians who can who can present this uh, this kind of agency and I think it's important to to discuss the the whole uh, refugee crisis uh, in the context of uh, of for the, in the, in the framework of globalization not only because because a different uh, because globalization itself just promotes migration, uh, because uh, those uh, environmental and, and demographic problems in these countries, uh, in the, the countries of origin, are partly caused by globalization, and also the well, the so-called blue factors uh, are also a result of globalization. So. I think it's important to to uh, to acknowledge and to understand those fears of people in also in Hungary and in other countries. Maybe, as we saw in the case of the U.S. election, uh, a certain part of the of the societies they uh, enjoy the advantages of globalization and of multiculturalism, but there's uh, there's a there's a high proportion of people who do not. You know, this was the, the issue over, over those uh, forgotten by the uh, uh, labor class. And I think from this perspective, <clears throat> if someone wants to give uh, a good answer to the refugee crisis, a liberal answer, an answer which <clears throat> actually respects liberal values, human rights, human dignity, it's also important to understand uh, that historic experiences uh, and fears of people in these countries. And if I'm talking about <clears throat> historic experiences, if it's important to note that uh, Hungarians have a different historic experience as, let's say, also like Czech people, or it's 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 different from from the from the experience of French people and so on. So I think, <clears throat> uh, and also the EU failed to to tackle these problems, to tackle the the this kind of uh, uncertainty. In, uh, in the European uh, demos. Uh, this means as well that we should move away from the top-down approach of policy making. So I think uh, to understand this, uh, this different context, it means also that politics should be more responsive, liberal politics should be more responsive. It's not only a matter of, of uh, of good governance, or it's, it's not only a matter of, of expertise, what should be done, what are actually the, the good, what are the best practices. But I don't mean necessarily that people should be involved directly into policy making, so I won't say that actually policy should be made up with the help of horizontal decision making. But my point is that, uh, and this is actually what Viktor Orban did, as he instrumentalized the refugee crisis, that his politics was more responsive. Uh, it uh, took, uh, actually, uh, his approach was to, uh, uh, to take into account these, especially these fears of, of these people. So a lot of people in Hungary who, who, are, who started to support uh, the, uh, this uh, refugee policy of Viktor Orban, they not, never even met with, uh, with someone from, from a different culture. And, uh, a lot of journalists just wrote about that. Why is that that people they 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 hate those who they didn't met? I think I think the first point that they first they, they fear these people, and uh, and this is what should be taken into account. And uh, it also means that such policy making shouldn't blame these people for not being educated or not can't be fit into multiculturalism because it would actually. Uh, strengthen the, the narrative of, of populist forces and populist parties. And my last point uh, to, to me that this introductory round is the, uh, the role of civil society in, the, uh, in finding good answers or, or making policies. As you remember, 2015, not only in Hungary but elsewhere, uh, there was a lot of bottom-up initiatives 
to, to aid refugees, to, to provide them food, water, shelter, uh, medical care. And I think it was great to see actually how people uh, became engaged in, in helping uh, uh, people they don't even know and uh, uh, they don't speak uh, uh, each other language. And from this point of view, I think it's very important that a year later, when uh, Viktor Orban launched this, uh, this uh, uh, referendum campaign uh, about the, the EU by the quota, it was interesting that those, the civil society uh, representatives, they totally missed. So this engagement of these people to help the refugees, it just lasted for some months. So it was liberal forces or the, the opposition parties in Hungary be not a partner with these uh, civil society uh, actors to, to maintain their engagement, to give them, to give them the, the chance to at least somehow participate in, uh, in, uh, in elaborating different answers than, uh, of uh, Viktor Orban. Well, it's also it's important to note that some of these civil society me uh, members or these people or these activists didn't really want to participate in in more serious politics, they just like to like to uh, help those uh, those people on the spot. But as a matter of fact, I think it's also important if we want to discuss uh, an EU level solutions. Uh, it is also important to know that I think there's been something like a, like a transnational movement uh, of uh, aiding refugees in whole Europe. So. In Budapest, there's been activists not only from Hungary, but, but from, from Austria, from Germany, from France. And also Hungarian activists now, they're working in, in Greece and they're aiding refugees there. So I think these could be uh, very big partners and it's also important that with the help of these actors, with help of these bottom-up initiatives, it's also uh, possible to, to uh, demonstrate others that actually refugees won't harm their culture and they won't take uh, their jobs. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, okay, so every crisis, uh, it seems so it's, there's a lesson to be learned, also how to respond, um, that the one way is the political level, another is the human level. But I would like to pass the word on uh, Jan. I hope you're going to provide, perhaps, as the Czech researchers on data. Uh, well, maybe not necessarily some data, but we will see. Well, I will thanks, uh, first of all, for uh, allowing me to speak in here. And second of all, thanks uh, the moderator slash the chair for, uh, for the floor. Since I'm focusing on, well, EU politics uh, in the field of migration, as I look border control, and <coughs> try to focus on, on, let's say, the development of EU, EU's policy towards migration slash, uh, slash asylum, uh, reflecting the recent developments, uh, including uh, what has been touched upon at the beginning, the statement, EU-Turkey statement on, or how it is very well known as uh, the EU-Turkey deal. So starting, uh, or moving a little bit backwards to, to the history, uh, the development of EU migration and asylum policy has been very much understood, um, you know, at, at, in the late 90s, uh, or early 90s within the Maastricht Treaty, but especially then in the late 90s in the Amsterdam Treaty, was understood as an attempt by member states to escape the liberal pressures from within the member states. Uh, it's called the logic of venue shopping, uh, whereby at home member states and the governments were facing, well, first of all, opposition, strong NGOs, as well as, and most importantly, the Kurds. Uh, and therefore, they decided to uh, move responsibility for asylum and immigration towards the EU level, where you don't have opposition as such, you don't have uh, strongly organized NGOs, or you did not have. And they established migration and asylum policy as a third pillar, justice and home affairs pillar, that was intergovernmental, and there was no jurisdiction of European Court of Justice, so they could very much easily avoid the jurisdiction of Kurds. Uh, now, this was the initial idea, uh, or at least this is the theory that explains it, um, the development of this policy field the best at the EU's level. Now, what has happened? Uh, if you look at the, the directives that form the Common European Asylum System and, and many other uh, legal acts that uh, form up the whole policy field, 
the policy field actually has become more liberal than it has been ever before within the member states. Uh, the reason probably was that there have been changes, treaty changes to the field. So since Amsterdam Treaty, and especially the Lisbon Treaty, the Court of Justice has full jurisdiction over migration and asylum. Uh, uh, secondly, NGOs have become more organized at the EU level. Uh, so the, the initial uh, actors that member states were trying to, uh, let's say, avoid have uh, emerged at the EU's level. And when you look at the, most of the rulings of European Court of Justice on the field, let's say, on the directives that form the common European asylum system, they usually, the directives and the regulation, one regulation, which is Dublin regulation, they are quite often very vague. And the Court of Justice has, when it made the rulings, had made very liberal, far-reaching rulings. Uh, and, you know, um, the governments, uh, nor the Commission, nor the European Parliament, could, you know, no longer avoid uh, the application of these rulings, because this is the final Court of Justice, European Court of Justice is the final authority. Uh, and how is that? Uh, so, what I was trying to make, um, uh, to say, or to, which kind of point I was trying to make, was that simply there was certain initiative at the beginning to avoid the liberal pressures and the whole policy field actually uh, uh, emerged eventually as much more liberal than expected by the member states at the beginning. Now how is it related to the current uh, uh, migration developments? Uh, you can see that member states are very well aware that uh, they are uh, aim to escape the liberal pressures from within the member states. Uh, had not been successful. And uh, that's also the reason why they focus very much on external border protection today. Because border policy uh, is uh, very much an external policy where uh, uh, the jurisdiction of Kurd is not as strong. Uh, and what most importantly, a strong border protection policy can prevent people from coming to Europe. Therefore, it can prevent them from enjoying this very liberal asylum and migration policy. And I'm not saying whether this is wrong or bad, I'm just trying to make some you know, comments on it. Uh, so don't, don't treat it as I uh, say something like that I'm in favor of this or that, because I'm not pretty much in favor of nothing of that. <laughs> I'm uh, like a chameleon. Uh, so that, that's one issue, that, that the, the, the focus on external borders can signal that member states are trying to avoid people coming in because once they are in, they will have the right to enjoy those very liberal uh, uh, rights that the common European asylum system and the migration policy uh, has uh, created. Now, I also see another connection very recently, uh, well, not very recently, recently was the ruling of the Court of Justice, or non ruling, but last year in March there was, you know, this accomplishment of the EU-Turkey deal, uh, which is not actually a new deal. Uh, it's called EU-Turkey Statement, but EU is not party to the deal. It's signed by the 28 member states. What is very interesting, it is a press release. It is nothing else than a press release. Uh, and it, First of all, then, it reflects the externalization logic, externalization of immigration trying to outsource it outside because Court of Justice does not have jurisdiction in Turkey, in Libya, anywhere else outside the EU. So it's about you know, ex externalizi externalizing uh, migration to avoid these pressures. And recently there has been a complaint, like six, seven months ago, there has been a complaint by two refugees uh, from Greece, and they basically said that the whole statement, eu Turkey statement, violates two principles. Uh, that is uh, non refoulement uh, because Turkey cannot be understood as a safe country. And secondly, mass expulsions. Uh, so mass returns, not, ba not based on individual basis, but returning all refugees who are members of the certain uh, member states, such as Syria and so on. Uh, you know, quite Surprisingly, or not only really surprisingly, the Court of Justice said, well, we have found out that the EU is not party to the deal. We cannot make any jurisdiction. Uh, we cannot make any judgment because it's not in our uh, jurisdiction. So again, what, what I'm trying to basically say that uh, the, the today's response of the EU and its member states is basically <laughs> reflecting uh, what made some may label over-liberalization of 
migration and asylum policy within, within the EU. Uh, and this is basically a response or a defense against this over-liberalization, a defense from the side of member states to try to avoid people get in here and to try to externalize responsibility for migration and potentially also asylum uh, from, uh, from the EU. So these were, this was probably the, the, the main point I was trying to do. And one last brief point to keep it brief and allow space for discussion was uh, we're very much focusing on, on the issue of integration today also. Uh, it's uh, quite logical and I believe important. But what, but what I see, there are certain problems. First, the member states, quite logically, they have different traditions. So what they say is that the EU shall not have jurisdiction or competences over integration policy. This is something done. Uh, this is something that is supposed to be done at the member state level because you know France is a different tradition than Germany and, and so on and so on. Uh, but w what is sometimes problematic that some of the funding should definitely be uh, going from the EU's level, I believe, to to. Uh, avoid some uh, duplications and to uh, to use the, some economic terms to make some uh, synergies in this in this funding. Uh, what is problematic when you speak about integration policy is sometimes that we have conflated it today with anti-radicalization, anti-extremism policy, and I don't believe that this strong focus on anti-extremism, anti-radicalization, while it is definitely important but it should not be conflated with integration policy. Integration policy is much more than security, well, avoiding security risk in terms of extremism or radicalization. It shall be part of it. Uh, but to a certain extent, uh, we have forgotten issues uh, related, or not definitely forgotten, but we are not focusing enough on issues related to labor market, so employment, language, and to a certain extent, citizenship. Uh, and we pretty much stress this issue of security, i.e. integration as a, as a fight against extremism and radicalization. Uh, so I believe that uh, member states should try to more benchmark and, you know, their integration policies and also try to uh, exchange best practices, share best practices when it comes to specific integration projects, especially when it comes to labor market, employment, schooling of, uh, of minors. Uh, very often they should, or importantly, they should probably make more common uh, uh, effort when it comes to language programs and good practices when it comes to introducing specific programs, such as, let's say, immigrants should not that easily get uh, social benefits unless they are trying to uh, get some uh, language improvements. In New Zealand, you would not be, uh, you would have to pay money uh, for language program that will be refunded if you get certain level of language proficiency within three months, you will get 100% refund. If you get this in a year, you will have 70% refund. Uh, these are some of the best practices that may also very well be used in, in Europe. But that's probably where we are lacking, uh, too fragmented sometimes, and not trying to find a common common ground and common approach to integration. And that's probably where I will uh, end, not to take uh, too much time, but uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, would anybody from the panel would like to comment? Yes, a few. Okay. And then we will give you floor for your questions. I yeah, just want to come into to the question of integration. I think it's also very important to take into account uh, the cultural dimension of integration as well. I think countries, so let's say in the United Kingdom and Australia, pop culture also supports integration. So you don't have this, uh, this, uh, this, this pop culture background in smaller countries like in, like in Czechia or in Hungary because we, have, we are following also this, this American uh, UK-based pop culture, and also I think the level of urbanization matters as well. So, like in in Hungary, there's uh, we can say that okay, Budapest is uh, is a big city, so it could be compared to 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 Munich or Berlin or other cities as well. But but uh, in other cities, there are much smaller communities. So in other countries, it's much more. Uh, for for example, in Germany, it's it's easier to integrate people. Uh, and at the, the, the Ruhrgebiet, uh, let's say, and also I think in Germany there's 
uh, the pop culture is also broader, so it can also uh, support integration. So I think these these cultural differences should be also taken into account if we if we are uh, discussing integration. Thanks. If I may, um, um, just advertisement. In a month's time, we're organizing for the city of Prague uh, the conference on integration of migrants in the big cities. We have invited several European cities to share. Um, we in IOM, we say promising practice rather than good practices. So to share promising practices because there is no you know, one fit for all uh, uh, process in this regard. So we have invited them to come to for two days uh, to Klangala's Palace to talk about promising practices in integration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, do we have any questions from the floor? Either migration, integration, current situation in the Czech Republic, in Hungary? Um, thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to ask Lucy, you talked about the migration industry and it's interesting that you know you listed a, a whole bunch of organizations, most of them illegal, but you also said helpers and of course there's lots of NGOs and just volunteers, average people going out and helping. How could it be a smart strategy, or or, or responsible strategy on those on, the, on behalf of those people to not to go into the illegal grounds? Because when you see on TV people <coughs> pulling out um, money, you know, say no borders, that's prob a problem, and they can be seen as agents of of smugglers and so. So how how can you? defend yourself against those um, accusations. Thank you. This is a very good question. The helpers in my meaning was it, you know, in brackets, okay? Uh, on the other hand, you have pointed out a very good question on, on that. Uh, the only uh, subject, the only agency that is responsible for admission is the government, okay? The government can outsource uh, very good organizations, NGOs that are service providers. One. At the same time, they are in uh, legal uh, framework working, so they know uh, about uh, the uh, all the uh, legal uh, provisions on admission and and so and so forth. So I think that the outsource by the government, uh, known NGOs, big NGOs, but even small NGOs that are operating local NGOs, and, and if international, uh, the better, uh, so that they work, can work on their behalf. How to arrange that they are not in contact with uh, smugglers, with the organized crime, uh, because of the funds, because of the money involved. Um, I believe that NGOs, uh, I mean, we are all people. I cannot say that it can never happen. But as far as I know, people working for NGOs and working for international organizations, they are not in contact with those people. I'm, I'm, you know, thank you. Just a short comment, if you allow me, because uh, there, I think there's a difference between the NGOs and, let's say, the, the No Borders movement because those people who are engaged in, uh, they have these uh, these banners you now at protests, let's say, then they are not in the, not necessarily working for NGOs, but they are part of uh, of the leftist, anarchist, autonomous movement claiming that no migrants is illegal and no, uh, the, the, we don't need borders, but I think so, uh, from the Hungarian perspective, the Hungarian government just amplified the, uh, uh, the, these voices and they claim that there is some kind of, uh, uh, there's a conspiracy between NGOs and, and activists and smugglers. Uh, but I think we should avoid to, to blame these people that they are using their rights to protest and, uh, 
and expressing their political opinion. And uh, it should be uh, we should uh, we should point to, to to the fact that in some cases these populist parties who are those who are amplifying the uh, the significance of these of these movements and they like to put them into the medley of, of smugglers and, and uh, civil organizations. As a matter of fact, uh, right now in Hungary, the government likes to stigmatize civil organizations and uh, uh, the government claims that these organizations uh, have, the, have the aim to, uh, to settle illegal migrants or refugees in Hungary. No borders, they fight against IOM only. <laughs> Do we have any other question? I might stand up because I'm not really talking. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me here. I'm uh, Tomasz Ingrid from the Consortium of Migrants Assisting Organizations. So yes, I'm from the NGO sector here in the Czech Republic. And uh, I, I feel that the, the, the debate is, is quite broad and, and, and general and maybe cherry picking on this and that topic, but uh, it would be really uh, good to maybe streamline it a little bit into what the liberals really think and what, they're, what is the distinct... Can I ask uh, you a question also? Yes, and uh, I, I would have a, a specific uh, issue to ask uh, really about and uh, that would be um, the, the, the issue of, of uh, basically the economy attracting uh, foreign workers and uh, so labor migration um, because I think this is really the topic of the day especially here in the Czech Republic but also in other countries it's not so much about the refugees or asylum seekers even uh, the question really is uh, how does the government want to uh, cope with this dilemma between uh, the labor market being short of labor force so we've heard that there are 150,000 free uh, labor uh, la labor uh, positions for foreign workers here in the Czech Republic and apparently uh, the economy is to some extent dependent on the foreign uh, working force and historically of course in Germany and many other countries their economic upswing was to a large extent driven by the so-called Gasarbeiter who then many of them stayed uh, afterwards so do we want the people to actually stay how do we how do we cope with the dilemma of on one hand uh, the economy being dependent and needing more foreign workers and on the other hand uh, the government being rather restrictive uh, and the public opinion also being uh, rather skeptical about the foreigners. If I may just for speakers to make clear, so you want to know if we should allow everyone or if we should tackle two separate issues, solve this problem of let's say economic migrants in the Czech case from Ukraine, Mongolia, etc. Et or to open up borders for anyone who would like to come. I'm just not very sure whether you mean. Not exactly that. Uh, I, I mean, what should be the, the policy strategies for a, vi for a sustainable and viable migration policy, which on one hand enables us to fulfill the needs of our labor market and our economy, and on the other hand doesn't uh, create a, a, a popular uproar? It's a super actual interesting question, so anybody from the panel? Well, uh, it's definitely an interesting question. Uh, a liberal would basically say that, uh, uh, or maybe somebody would make it a radical liberal, that uh, migration policy choices should basically be mostly reflecting demography and labor market needs of a given country. Uh, now, a bit of personal statement. This is uh, too, uh, too liberal for me. Uh, this, uh, this definitely, at least in my point of view, cannot be the uh, the only uh, criterion on uh, on which um, well, basic, basically on which to decide uh, migration policy. Now, if you if you focus on the, the labor market needs, let's say, uh, first of all, this is definitely something not connected to current migration. So you call it or migration refugee crisis because uh, we don't have a uh, singular definition of it, uh, especially not in here in the Czech Republic because we cannot expect that our uh, labor market uh, asks for people from you know let's say Syria, Afghanistan, Pakistan now very much because some tradition is here to ask for people uh, especially from from Eastern countries. Uh, but what is important? 
if you read some government papers and as well as, as well as you know the debates in the Committee on European Affairs, uh, there is a clear policy in the Czech Republic uh, to separate labor and irregular uh, mi migration, which in my sense is a bit wrong because these are very much two connected issues. Uh, there's also research focusing on how uh, visa policy and irregular immigration policy influences uh, uh, legal migration uh, policy. So we should probably, as, as a country, speaking of the Czech Republic, try to get more open-minded, flexible and liberal when it comes to labor market needs and migration, especially from traditional areas. Uh, and there's been a lot of buzz about it uh, within the government for last year, how they want to speed up the process. Uh, I know from some of the companies that the process is so long uh, to just get a couple of, let's say, Ukrainians now as an example, uh, uh, to get all the uh, paperwork done, uh, then uh, you, you won't usually get it within less than a year. Uh, six months is a minimum if you're very privileged, but, uh, but a year. Uh, but at the same time, you should probably not uh, conflate this discussion with the discussion of uh, the current refugee and migration crisis, uh, border protection, because uh, I believe that this labor market choices should be very much be done by individual member states of the EU, even though we may have some blue card directive for high skilled workers and so on. Uh, the differing traditions in different member states will probably require uh, uh, individual member states to pursue their own labor migration policies. But I don't really believe that societies in many of these member states, despite the need of uh, employees, uh, will be very open to, to accept more, uh, uh, more uh, let's say, non-EU foreigners. Now, the question, the, your, your question is how, how to really do that. Uh, well, I just came uh, yesterday in the evening from a conference in Miami. And I've been on a panel when I was presenting on framing of, framing of immigration in Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, there was also some of my colleagues focusing on the very similar topic. And uh, we pretty much, the research very much agreed that uh, there is a prevalent way how media frame uh, immigration. Uh, and not necessarily only from Middle East and so on. And this is a very much a security, uh, security topic. And when they frame it in terms of economy, it's again an economic threat. Uh, to welfare state, uh, to traditional employees from the given country, uh, so you know foreigners taking up the job, uh, and I believe that uh, this framing is very much reflecting, but also influencing the public opinion, uh, and, and sometimes influencing more than reflecting. Uh, so, you know, if you take these dominant frames into account, and uh, you somehow take also into account that, or you somehow estimate that they will go on, go on they will continue in future, which I, I'm afraid they will, uh, it will be very tough to attract any labor migration in, uh, in the Czech Republic or any other country uh, where prevalent um, media frames are uh, based on security or economic threat framing rather than uh, uh, economic contribution. As much as you said, there are no studies. We have studies in the UK on the economic impact. We have studies in different countries. We don't really have uh, studies in the Czech Republic. No, I just, I think that uh, you know the answer yourself. <laughs> that the dilemma is there, is here. Uh, and uh, yes, we should have the legal channels open in order to let people work if there is, uh, if they have something to offer, and if we can, uh, if the society can offer some uh, labor space for them, which is which is for the Czech Republic true, uh, there is labor shortage. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if we think that the Czech Republic is on the migratory trend east-west, not south-north, we know from where. Uh, people are coming. Uh, former Soviet Union countries, definitely Ukraine is number one in all the statistics. Uh, we can talk about uh, Vietnam and, and Mongolia and all that. We don't have much uh, or many people coming from south. So this is something where, uh, I mean, th this is the 
um, the legal channel that should be open all the time and uh, that the government should mm, not use uh, um, the, um, how should I put it, the, uh, the uh, security net like visa point, but it should need much more flexible and more quick uh, process uh, to, to respond to the need of the labor market and at the same time to the, to the offer of, of migrants or people coming. I don't feel that uh, there should be economic threat on that on the, because I believe that people are, uh, I mean, helping the society, helping the economy uh, themselves and also through remittances their country of origin. Thank you. I just want to add one thing to the media framing of, uh, <clears throat> of this economic dimension or if it's, if it's most framed as a threat or not. Uh, as I already mentioned, there was this billboard campaign <clears throat> about uh, the loss of jobs, uh, um, which is caused by, by migrants or there's there a threat. But I think it's also important that the, <coughs> sorry, that the opposition failed to, to reframe uh, the economic threat, because also the, uh, the opposition parties, and mostly the civil society organizations, they framed uh, migrants as, as people who, who should be cared about, who are dependent on, on help, and they are just passive people, and exactly this this economic or, or labor market dimension could somehow emphasize that these people are also capable of responsibility taking, and they are also capable of, of entrepreneurship, and so on. I know very well that the, the German um, uh, labor agency, there have been some statistics that uh, this is not true that all of these people who came from Syria have a, have a, a, a PhD, but, uh, but, but, but still, uh, in the Hungarian uh, uh, public sphere, the whole uh, migration, it was only about help these people, aid them, and not to, not to uh, frame them, or not to look at them, or deem them as people who are also able, of, who could be also active. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's an important failure, which was also uh, committed by, by the civil society. Of course, it was not intended to do that, but still I think uh, these people and also the opposition should uh, should somehow be able to reframe that. And we started at the Republican Institute to, uh, to draft uh, uh, something which could be put on the table. Uh, how could be uh, this? It was actually a plan similar to the Austrian solution. But, uh, well, at the end of the day, uh, the whole political debates just changed in Hungary. So it was, uh, it was more like into, uh, it was a domestic issue anymore, so not really about the, um, the fate of, of refugees. And if, if I may comment on it, it's also the question for legislators, because there are people who would like to support it, even people in government who would like to give jobs to foreigners and they can't really do it because the process is so complicated. So it's definitely a really uh, it's a question which should be answered and placed. But perhaps it's really important to distinguish that this is something viable for the state and then there are other <coughs> issues. Would you like to elaborate on it? or is it okay? So do we have uh, more questions, Vasa? Good morning. My name is Vasco Batuski. I work for Friedrich Hamel Foundation, Liberal Political Foundation, also dealing with migration. Uh, my son, not. Uh, so, a sh short disclaimer I'm kind of layman and uh, uh, partly uneducated, so I try to educate myself uh, during this event. I, I take this opportunity to ask several questions which are which are raised by my friends when they ask me, so what liberals do think about this issue, which is pretty uh, thorny and, and tricky for us, I would say. Uh, I would begin, I would have three questions for all of the panelists. Uh, I would begin with the situation in Hungary. Uh, as far as I'm informed, there was new, uh, new update on the laws, especially the asylum seekers, uh, uh, secret seekers laws in, in Hungary in March and uh, in April, which caused uh, which, uh, yeah, which caused some uh, international outcry by um, international organizations because obviously 
the Orban government tightened up the rules and uh, created something like a detention camps at the, at the uh, border with, with Serbia. And there was a huge discussion that that, that is actually something like a <coughs> concentration camp. So, but still, uh, we see that for, uh, Orban has a pretty high support uh, uh, among the voters. So, I would have the, the first question to uh, Daniel: How he sees this, uh, especially vis-à-vis -vis the upcoming elections in Hungary, whether this will drive the electoral uh, um, the, the campaign, and whether Orban will still play this card. Um, my more uh, two general questions to the other panelists would be uh, uh, about the subsidiarity. Uh, I found uh, the remarks by Jan uh, very interesting in terms of how um, how it came that the migration as asylum policy were shifted to towards the EU. Now we have the context of the debate of the future of the EU and possible reshaping of the basic treaties. Uh, if you could say uh, that what would, what would be your recommendation on, on in terms of subsidiarity? What should the EU really do? Uh, we heard several times that uh, it's, it's, it's a tricky thing, that many things should be probably decided still by national um, na nations, uh, states. Um, I come from liberal uh, circles where we hear people like Hofstadt calling for a truly European solution. Uh, truly European policies, but we, we still um, know that there is nothing like European identity. So, what would be your recommendation? Maybe this could be also a question to to uh, Lucia Slatkova and uh, or or Jan Kovac. And, and my uh, last question, which might be, I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, I, I think especially in terms of uh, refugees, that uh, whether we have the right. Um, right law tools for such a situation. To me it seems that if somebody asks for uh, asylum, it's a, by nature a very much individual case-by-case case process, uh, which means the courts always consider the situation of each individual and then they decide, which takes a lot of time. Is this tool suitable for a situation where we have war and where, where hundreds of thousands of people are fleeing and the courts are overwhelmed uh, and uh, are not capable of really handling the situation. And then people, in my opinion, have the feeling that rule of law is failing. Um, is, is it that, uh, that there could be potentially other rules uh, or other tools? I, I've heard several people commenting that in the EU treaties there is some special tool which haven't been really used at all. My assumption was that it would probably create some, some kind of push factor <coughs> Sorry, pull, pull factor for actually increasing the migration, but I was always wondering whether we have the right tools. Sorry for being quite long, but this piece could be the free question. Thank you, sir. To the, to the Hungarian case, yes, it's true. So the, the assembly was changed, and uh, uh, refugees or, or asylum seekers can be put into custody. So it is claimed that this is how uh, the, uh, the free movement in the Schengen zone can be maintained because then. Uh, these people can't uh, leave Hungary uh, uh, before the, the, this whole legal process would, would, be, would be ended. Uh, as a matter of fact, it is uh, it's not such an issue anymore in Hungary as it was two years ago or even one year ago. So uh, as probably you know that now the, uh, uh, the next scapegoat is not necessarily migrants or refugees, but, but George Soros and uh, the Central European University and this uh, and this uh, there's this like there's a conspiracy that that uh, George Soros is supporting civil society organization and as I already mentioned the aim is to uh, is to settle migrants in Hungary so uh, and uh, this is how they this is how into the government imprints the whole idea of open society and uh, as a I think that. Orban won't play this card, the, the refugee card, directly, but there is a, a set of, of different interpretations and, and uh, a, a bigger narrative where the, the refugees, the migrants, has their own uh, place as well. But still, a majority of the Hungarians uh, are against uh, migration. But you know, in some cases, maybe uh, a frame, so to say, or a narrative could be could be could have a centrality, but it doesn't have a high hierarchy. 
let's say, like in the case of uh, saving the environment, most of the Hungarians say, I think that was a poll, I think 85% said that protecting the environment is very important, but still there's no... Uh, the LNP Green Party is at about 4 5%, so near the threshold. So if still people are supporting an idea, it doesn't mean necessarily that they would vote uh, into a certain direction because of that idea. So this is why I think uh, Viktor Orban would come up not directly with, with, the, with the refugee crisis and, and migration as a threat, but they're gonna, gonna uh, connect it to, to George Soros and so like a, like a bigger or, or, or a conspiracy against Hungary and high level. Uh, we'll see if it's gonna function or not. Maybe, maybe you are aware of the recent developments in Hungary with the Central European University and the, and the demonstrations there. And uh, maybe uh, this, uh, this whole conspiracy thing. And also that there's this, this is, uh, uh, the, the protesters are also saying that this whole urban regime is much too, uh, it's confronting too much with the West and it's, it's befriended with, with Putin, Russia and so on. So this whole thing uh, from, from, the, from the Hungarian government that they're claiming that George Soros is attacking Hungary, it's somehow strengthening the, uh, the claim of the opposition that, that Orban is going to follow the same route as, as Putin did with civil organizations and so on. Sorry for not uh, actually uh, responding to migration issues, but this was a question, I think. Thank you. I forgot the second question. It was about subsidiarity. Uh, EU would, you let, would you let me to answer the third question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the question was, is there any other provision than uh, the asylum process uh, because it was meant uh, for individual cases? You are absolutely right. Uh, Geneva Convention and Noel Protocol, it was uh, designed and, and, and meant for individual uh, claims uh, for, uh, for uh, asylum at that time, international protection nowadays. <coughs> At the same time, you cannot stop people uh, from asking for, for international protection for asylum. The provision is there. Uh, all of the uh, EU member states uh, uh, have uh, their uh, law on temporary protection. The temporary protection is, uh, how should I put it, it's a, a sort of a sleeping law and it can be activated only by the government. If the government has enough funds uh, and, and, and goodwill and, and accommodation and I don't know what, uh, then you activate the uh, uh, temporary protection. But normally it is, do it is done not only in one country, it is the decision of number of countries that for these and those uh, uh, fleeing people from its territory, from their territory, uh, they should be given granted temporary protection. It has been done uh, during the Kosovo crisis, the same was for Bosnian crisis. Uh, why it is not for Syrian crisis, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the response for that are uh, very peculiar uh, because some say that uh, for temporary protection uh, people there are some limitations as uh, for the they, they can work but you know there are some limitations as to the timing while if you are granted refugee status it is uh, that there is no time it is no stop time and uh, so People rather ask for asylum, you cannot stop them for doing that. And temporary protection was not used at, at this time, you are absolutely right. There are provisions, but uh, if uh, you have to fulfill the asylum process, uh, it's uh, a technical process, you just, you have to 
uh, you have to invite more asylum decision uh, officials to deal with the process and uh, not uh, you know not letting people wait for years months and I don't know what somewhere in the camps uh, or some other accommodation which is not uh, uh, which is not good for people, which is uh, rather, you know, ugly, ugly space. So, yes, you have to, uh, if, if they ask for asylum, you have to fulfill and do the process from the beginning to the end, which means also the appeal and, uh, you know, to, to the court, everything, the whole process. And then, if you are not successful, then should come the return. Uh, thanks for your question. I may start from the end. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the EU has a temporary uh, protection directive uh, adopted in 2001, I believe. Uh, it uh, has never been used in so far. Uh, never been used so far. Uh, well, it has been made for the cases such as you know, uh, Western Balkans wars, uh, especially Kosovo war. Uh, why it is not used? Very importantly, it's uh, not used because, uh, as you said, it's a, a bit of a uh, no, proof factor, but more importantly, uh, within the decision to activate the directive, uh, the group of protected people needs to, needs to be defined. Uh, so usually, you know, people coming from certain places of conflict in Syria, if you apply it to Syria, it's sometimes quite hard to judge who comes from which part of Syria, whether there is a conflict going on uh, or not, because they may not have the documents uh, anymore. So therefore, anybody who is Syrian may very much uh, say that he's living in this or that part, even though the whole card would not be boring, for example. Uh, and the, the most important problem is the case of returns, I believe, in Temporary Protection Directive. Uh, it's normally uh, activated for two years, can be prolonged uh, by an additional, uh, uh, additional decision for another year, 12 months, uh, and then, then for another 12 months uh, in an extraordinary uh, situation. But the problem is then the people should be returning. Uh, but we know how efficient return is when it comes to you know, normal, irregular, how you know, in the US they would say illegal immigrants. Uh, uh, well, we're returning. Now Frontex has uh, improved, the member states have improved, and we are already returning like 40% of people, uh, which is still less than half of those who have uh, been issued a return decision. Uh, now this is obviously a uh, very important issue when it comes to temporary protection directive because it is a group application to protection. So you basically say a group of people will be all uh, given the, the protection status, and then you will have to ensure their returns. Uh, but uh, you know, as I spoke about it earlier, member states are trying to, by externalizing migration and strengthening border protection, they're trying to avoid people coming into Europe and enjoying the liberal uh, asylum uh, rights. Therefore, if you apply or if you activate a uh, temporary protection directive, you're just as a member state, you're just going against what uh, uh, the intention of most member states is, and you have to uh, activate it by qualified majority voting. Uh, so this is probably the reason they will not uh, they will not do that, or they did not uh, they did not do it, uh, at least from my point of view. Uh, concerning the subsidiarity question, uh, briefly, well, yeah, that's uh, been a lot of talk about you know more subsidiarity, more national parliaments powers. Uh, well, maybe a provocative answer sometimes, uh, less subsidiarity would be a better answer, uh, but not necessarily for the citizens of the, uh, of the individual member states, but for the efficiency of the policies. Uh, however, these two trends very often don't go hand in hand, uh, so you have to reflect public opinion. Uh, but I was, I was talking about integration. This is something where, from my point of view, uh, subsidiarity principle should and still applies uh, this should uh, be done at the member state level, or local level, or regional level. Uh, but when it comes to uh, border protection, I mean that uh, I guess the last two years has shown that uh, any 
fragmentation or nationalization of uh, border protection simply does not work because then member states such as Italy or Greece, and I can very easily understand them, they have no uh, intent, intention or incentives to protect the external border if the if Dublin regulation is in place because then they would have to you know, process all the asylum applications. So what I would do as a, as a governmental member there, I would just open the borders, transfer the people on the bus and let them go to whatever other member state. Because you know they will, the member states, most of them will not help you with uh, processing asylum applications, and definitely not on you know uh, redistributing refugees. That we, as we have seen the response. But in this sense, border protection should be less subsidiarized uh, than it is even today, and there is no principle of subsidiarity. But you, we still don't have EU agencies such as US agency I, uh, for border protection. I know that goes against the swearing, the argumentation of many member states, and for the Czech, Czech Republic it's very easy to uh, advocate for fully fledged agency because we don't have external borders except for international airports. Uh, but this is where I believe less subsidiarity should be the answer. Sometimes the differences in per, uh, processing of asylum applications are so huge, uh, you know, in different countries, uh, you know, the, the, the mechanisms are different, the outcomes are different. So sometimes it seems that too much subsidiarity in this sense, uh, too much powers of member states is also harmful. But on the other hand, you will have the typical argument, well, member states need to have the sovereignty to, to decide who will they allow or not to their territory, which in Schengen is not true anyway. Uh, because I can go to Germany and Germany cannot decide whether I go there or not. Uh, well, if I'm a security threat, they can, but they will not know that because they will not know that when I'm crossing the internal border between the two countries. So it's also, you know, not absolute, this argument that um, states should, con uh, should be able to control everybody because simply they are not even, you know, even today. So I would say that in certain aspects of asylum, immigration and border control, we should have more supranationalization or uh, let's say moving of jurisdiction upwards uh, in terms of the efficiency of the policy. On the other hand, when you take into account public opinion, this is something that is, uh, from my point of uh, view, unthinkable. Uh, and we will have to deal with this uh, dilemma in, uh, in future. Thank you. Do we have any other, let's say, maybe perhaps last question? Or we can continue over more breakfast, and you can, of course, uh, pick up brains of our speakers. So. Well, if you don't have any other question, then I would like to thank our speakers. Um, I know the issue was maybe perhaps the topic was broad, but it's a broad topic, and everybody had the right to look at it from his or her point of view. <clears throat> so thank you very much for participation, and especially to our speakers. Hope that the discussion will continue and carry on and now in the most informal manner. <laughs>